If I come up to a person, they're lying down, uh, and I realize that they don't have pulses, I should immediately start doing CPR. A lot of people tell you to do them to the beat of staying alive by the Bee Gees. So imagine like really pumping on somebody's chest, singing, uh, 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 staying alive. Hey, I'm Dr. Italo Brown, emergency physician in Palo Alto, California. Today we're going to try to debunk some of the myths about your health and some of the things that you've been using on a day-to-day -day basis that might not be so good. You can't die from a broken heart. Broken heart syndrome is real. You can actually die from a broken heart. We got a really nifty Japanese name for it called Takatsubo cardiomyopathy. The word Takatsubo is describing a pot, like an octopus pot. The heart takes on the shape of that octopus pot in these situations where you have intense feelings, you have stress that is applied instantaneously. So imagine answering the phone to find out that a loved one has passed. It can cause somebody's heart to actually change shape. The, the ventricles or the, the part that forces blood around the body can bow out like a balloon. And we call that apical ballooning. When that heart starts to change shapes, it can lead to something that's not common or native to the heart. And that can lead to a sudden death. We tend to follow the same regimen that we would follow for someone who comes in with other chest pain like features, specifically severe chest pain. Anyone who has an emotional response, who is sentient, has the capacity to have this issue. You should put butter on a burn. You should definitely not put butter on a burn. We're not baking bread. It's probably one of the worst things to put on a burn. In most pre-hospital management of burns, we do not recommend using any creams, any lotions, whatever else is in your refrigerator. Do not put that on a burn. Those chemicals can actually worsen the surface that is burned. The most severe burns that I worry about are ones that happen to the areas of the face, the hands, the groin, these burns can potentially damage uh, a lot of other underlying function and can lead to long-term dysfunction. So if that happens, come to the emergency department immediately. Depending on the surface area covered, a burn wound can uh, actually draw water from the body and leave you dehydrated. So it's important to have adequate hydration, which is why we admit a lot of folks who have complicated burns of second degree or third degree nature. The most common thing that we say, dude, is put it under cold water and then try to isolate that injury. Cracking your knuckles is bad. Cracking your knuckles doesn't necessarily lead to any bad outcomes. Most of us were told this as kids because it was just annoying. It didn't have anything to do with the, the real medical element to it. The sound that we hear, though, is something that frightens people or it is awkward. We're usually... Uh, thinking that that's bone on bone action when in actuality it's about the fluid in between the joints. So synovial fluid helps to lubricate those joints. When we crack our knuckles, it's really just an air pocket being burst. And that's what the sound is. Most folks believe that putting pressure on joints or, or consistently cracking these joints will lead to some form of arthritis. And that's not necessarily true. We understand that Arthritis is usually a condition that develops over time. And whether you crack your knuckles or not, it can still happen. When you start to crack other parts of the body and joints, some of them actually are super relieving. You know, cracking a hip, that may make someone feel extremely better and move around a little bit more agile. When cracking is accompanied by pain, that may be an indicator to go see uh, your normal physician. And then in some cases, it may even require an orthopedist or physical therapy. I typically don't recommend cracking your neck because if you're pushing your neck beyond its normal range of motion, you might be stretching blood vessels that are surrounding that and cause a rupture that way. So it's not so much the cracking sound, but it's the motion and the exertion of force that can lead to a secondary issue. I would recommend just stretching and, you know, crack your knuckles. Sometimes, you know, you need that. <laughs> CPR is effective if someone flatlines. CPR is an extremely useful procedure as part of basic life support. I think that it's extremely valuable for people to know how to do basic life support, particularly compressions, because of all the things that we know, this actually saves lives. Flatlining is an absence of cardiac activity when you look at a cardiac monitor. Most people describe it as that sound with the flat line across. We're talking about the actual heart electrical activity. 
Like CPR is an entire process, whereas what we're discussing specifically are chest compressions. That's the hand over hand applying force to the external portion of the body to create that force to drive blood around. Doing that compressions, adding ventilation or breathing in somebody's mouth or using a breathing aid to apply oxygen to the lungs and then doing this in succession to eventually bring someone back or regain pulses, regain cardiac activity. If I come up to a person, they're lying down and I realize that they don't have pulses, I should immediately start doing CPR. And these compressions are supposed to be about two inches deep and they're supposed to be fast, like rapid compressions. So I almost expect in that first compression to break through ribs because you need to create enough force to push blood flow around the entire body. A lot of people tell you to do them to the beat of staying alive by the Bee Gees. So imagine like really pumping on somebody's chest singing, uh, 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 staying alive. That's pretty much what we do. Someone who is trained as a first responder or who has received basic life support training can initiate CPR. CPR when done properly can actually resuscitate people. Tilting your head back will stop the nosebleed. So most people instinctively think to lean their head back as if they're trying to like use gravity to keep the blood from going down their nose. But really, it's pulling it down the back part of the nose, the nasopharynx, and that directly connects to your airway. So if the bleeding is so profuse or so brisk that it's filling up the mouth, it can compromise your breathing. That's dangerous. So we typically tell people to lean forward uh, and pinch their nose really hard. With most bleeding, the goal is to apply pressure to the direct side of the bleed. And because you can't reach into the nose and actually like tap down an artery, we usually recommend grabbing the cartilaginous or the cartilage portion of the nose instead of the bridge. There are different reasons why nosebleeds can occur. The most common reason is direct trauma or irritation of some part of the membranes inside the nose. So they're like small capillaries there that can rupture. The main goal is, does the bleeding stop by just applying pressure? It's completely manageable at home However, if you start to have like worsening symptoms like repeat or recurrent bleeds, lightheadedness, dizziness, if the bleeding is extremely quick, you need to get in a car and go to the emergency department. But don't tilt your head back in the car. <laughs> a migraine is just a bad headache. This is not necessarily false, but it's poor understanding of the difference between migraines and headaches. So when we think about headaches in general, this is tension in the head. It can be something that is pounding or pulsatile. The difference with a migraine though is, so we're talking about multiple hours to days of unrelenting pain. The main characteristic is that this is extremely painful and debilitating. It stops your normal function of activities, which is why we treat them so seriously. When you talk about migraines, you can have a simple migraine or a complex migraine. We usually think about complex migraines as having an aura or other features that are more sensitory to them besides just the pain element. You might feel dizziness. You might feel ringing in the ears or some visual changes, blurry vision, these things come uh, with complex migraines and it can be extremely debilitating. So if you're at home and you start to feel that migraine uh, build up a little bit, I usually recommend that someone goes to a very quiet space in their home, turn off all the lights, take their standard medications and drink some water. Sometimes caffeine helps. So people will drink a tall cup of coffee to help abate some of those symptoms. Those are simple things that you can do at home to try to treat a migraine. But if it ever lasts longer than four to six hours after you do this or several days of you trying these preventative measures, come see us. Vaping is safe. This is 100% False. Vaping is not safe. We know that vaping is a, a trendy thing now that people are doing. This is electronic cigarettes. Usually it's got some type of a cartridge with uh, nicotine as a product mixed in with other products and compounds so that you can aerosolize it and inhale it. We started to realize that it is so extremely harmful that it can lead to long hospital admissions and ICU stays. One of the things that people have traced the particular hazards of vaping too is vitamin E. A lot of these compounds that people are putting in to uh, the, the cartridge and fluid of a vaping pen haven't been studied well. That vitamin E compound has been known to destroy the small air pockets of the lung known as alveoli. This is where the harm starts. We call that acute lung injury. We know that 
this leads to people having severe lung dysfunction. We understand that it also ruins the lung's ability to actually grab oxygen from the bloodstream because of that material that's coating the alveoli. Most people switch from tobacco to this product because they find that they want to be less likely to have uh, lung cancer, but still need nicotine because there is an addiction to nicotine. That is why it was initially sought as a uh, harm reduction measure. It actually increases the type of harm that you can have. It just shifts it over from one type to another. If you do have nicotine addiction and you need help stopping uh, that particular craving, there are so many programs that will work with you to figure out like, do you need just counseling? Is there a need for uh, a medication assistance or patches? These are known ways to curb the appetite of nicotine. I don't recommend vaping. I think that is harmful. I think that it is a habit that can lead to someone losing their life or their ability to breathe freely. So put the pins down, y'all. Vicks Vapor Rub can be used anywhere on the body. These mentholated topical ointments cannot be used in every location in the body. Specifically, they cannot be ingested. If you even look at one of the canisters, it has a warning label that says, do not swallow this. I know this because I've watched my grandfather. He used to swallow a nice little dab of Vicks as well as rub it all over his chest and underneath his nose. He said that it helped him fight a cold. Well, now that I'm a ER physician, I've heard those same stories but they don't always end the same way. So I don't recommend using Vicks Vapor Rub in other locations than already designated by the manufacturers. I also don't recommend ingesting anything that has the toxic property camphor. That's the key element. You have to read the labels. Just put it on your chest, walk around smelling like you're 78 years old, it's fine. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. This is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. <laughs> If it were that easy to keep doctors away, uh, I promise you apples wouldn't cost 59 cents. They'd be far more expensive. If you're just literally basing it on a Granny Smith apple, I'm tell you right now, that's not gonna work. The only thing that I can think of right off the bat that you can do daily that helps your immune system is to eat a well-rounded meal. And that goes for children all the way through older adults. All the necessary nutrients, you have all your macromolecules in it, some serving of fruits, vegetables, maybe a little bit of grain, some form of protein, something that's going to uh, give you the building blocks that your body needs to do the processes through the day uh, to keep you moving. I'm Dr. Italo Brown, just reminding you guys, take your health seriously. Be careful about the information that you hear floating around. If it sounds weird, if it has some type of odd little story to it, chances are it might not be true. We only have one body. It's important to know what you put on your body and in your body. Let's go ahead and talk to our doctors and have a good conversation with them. And you do everything in your power to stay informed.